The cyclization of the open chain form of a monosaccharide creates a stereocenter at the anomeric carbon. And the configuration of this stereocenter depends on how the hydroxyl group adds to the carbonyl group from one face or the other. The faces of the carbonyl group in an open chain monosaccharide are diastereotopic because of all these other stereocenters in the structure. As a result, addition of the hydroxyl group to one face or the other gives rise to diastereomers. These two structures differ in configuration at the starred carbon, but they have the same configuration at all the other stereocenters. Diastereomers of cyclic monosaccharides that differ only in configuration at the anomeric carbon are called anomers. In fact, that's where the name anomeric carbon comes from. And like all diastereomers, anomers have different physical properties, and we would expect these to form in unequal amounts if we started, for example, with 100% open chain D-glucose, we would expect more of either the alpha or beta anomer. In fact, it's not too difficult to predict which of the two anomers will be favored at equilibrium. To do this, we only need to think back to cyclohexane chairs and where substituents prefer to reside in cyclohexane chair structures. Substituents tend to prefer to be equatorial rather than axial, and we see an equatorial hydroxyl group in beta-D-glucose and an axial hydroxyl group coming in to alpha-D-glucose. And for this reason, the beta anomer tends to be favored over the al alpha anomer. In the case of D-glucose, the ratio is 64% beta anomer and 36% alpha anomer. And this is exactly what we would predict qualitatively considering the stability of axial versus equatorial substituents in a cyclohexane ring, which is highly analogous to this glucopyranose. If we start with a sample of pure anomer, for example, a sample that is solely beta-D-glucose, and dissolve it in solution with acid or base catalyst, something interesting happens. Beta-D-glucose is a chiral compound. This is pretty clearly chiral with a large number of stereocenters and no plane of symmetry, and so it exhibits optical rotation. And the optical rotation of a pure sample of beta-D-glucose is plus 18.7 degrees. But if we dissolve that beta-D-glucose in, say, water, and allow the solution to sit for a while, the observed specific rotation shifts to 52.7 degrees. So something's happening to change the structure of beta-D-glucose. And what's happening is the formation of alpha-D-glucose in a reversible reaction. The specific rotation of the alpha anomer is 112.2 degrees, and what we find at equilibrium is that the observed rotation of now the mixture of the two is between the specific rotations of the beta and alpha anomers. The chemical process that gives rise to this change in specific rotation is aptly called muta rotation. Essentially what's happening here is reversible opening and reclosing of the beta D-glucose to form some alpha D-glucose. And so I won't draw the mechanism in all of its gory detail, but essentially what happens here is first the reversible ring opening of beta D-glucose to form the open chain form, followed by a bond rotation about the bond linking the carbonyl and alpha carbons to flip the carbonyl group over. This exposes the opposite face of the carbonyl group to the 5-hydroxyl group. And recyclization through an acid or base catalyzed hemiacetal formation forms alpha-D-glucose, the other anomer. All three of these steps are reversible, such that at equilibrium we end up with a mixture of the alpha and beta anomers. And it's that 36% alpha-D-glucose mixture and 64% beta-D-glucose mixture that we saw on the previous slide. In fact, if you do the math on weighting the specific rotations using these percentages, you'll arrive at a weighted rotation of 52.7 degrees, which is exactly how this ratio was determined experimentally. The last point I'll make about muta rotation is that it uses elementary steps that are either exactly the same as or the microscopic reverses of the ones we saw for cyclization of monosaccharides in the last video. So for example, this reclosing of the open chain form to form alpha D glucose is nothing more than catalyzed ADN with a proton transfer followed by nucleophilic addition followed by another proton transfer. The initial ring opening is absolutely nothing more than catalyzed 
beta elimination, the microscopic reverse of nucleophilic addition. There's one last interesting observation we need to make about the ratio of anomers at equilibrium for glucose, and the same phenomenon happens with other monosaccharides as well. This 64 to 36 percent ratio is actually smaller than we might expect at first glance, particularly thinking about cyclohexanes, right? Typically, the A value, that, that which represents the stability difference between axial and equatorial cyclohexane shares, is something on the order of one kilocalorie per mole, or a little bit larger even in some cases. And that would suggest a ratio of equatorial to axial that's actually much larger than the 64 to 36 that we actually see. If you do the math on this, what we would expect is something more along the lines of 89% beta D-glucose with the equatorial hydroxyl and only 11% alpha D-glucose with the axial hydroxyl group. The actual ratio we observe is 64 to 36. So why is there more of the axial anomer around than we would expect just based on, for example, cyclohexane A values or simple calculations of the energies of these two diastereomers. What this means is that the axial anomer or the alpha anomer is somehow more stable than it would be in the absence of some additional effect. And the additional stabilization is explained by an orbital interaction that exists in the alpha anomer that does not exist in the beta anomer called the anomeric effect. And to begin to see this, the first thing we should point out is that this oxygen that's within the ring has a potentially good electron source associated with it. It's got a non-bonding lone pair that's kind of in a pseudo-axial position. So if we draw the hybrid orbital that contains that lone pair, it might look something like this. And that axial type lone pair is well aligned to overlap with the sigma star or sigma antibonding orbital of the CO bond, whose low bond carbon looks something like this. The low bond oxygen is somewhat smaller and would look something like this. So in this axial anomer, we have the potential for an orbital interaction from the electron rich or electron source in orbital to the electron deficient or electron poor or empty sigma star orbital for the CO bond. And it's this orbital interaction that stabilizes the alpha anomer over the beta anomer where this interaction is not possible, although the beta anomer does still have that axial type lone pair sitting here. That lone pair is not well aligned with the CO sigma star orbital now that the CO bond is in an equatorial position. So there's no interaction here in the beta anomer. This image, which was derived from calculations, NBO calculations, on a model system meant to resemble the hemiacetal in a glucopyranose, shows this interaction in a little more detail. So here's the non-bonding orbital. It's actually a 2p orbital in reality, although I drew it as a hybrid on our drawing over here. Close enough, close enough for the organic chemist anyway. And notice that the acceptor orbital here, the empty orbital in the interaction, is the CO sigma star orbital with the larger lobe on carbon and very strong overlap with the adjacent N orbital. That orbital interaction results in stabilization and the experimental manifestation of that, the experimental evidence that that stabilization is coming into play is the fact that we observe more of the alpha anomer, 36%, than we would expect if that interaction were turned off, in which case we would only see 11% of the alpha anomer. This stabilization effect is called the anomeric effect because it involves an orbital interaction centered on the anomeric carbon. In this model system, the anomeric carbon is right here. And in the drawings we made over here, of course, the anomeric carbon is sitting right here. It's the carbon of the CO bond that's involved. This can show up in other contexts where a lone pair is appropriately aligned to overlap with a sigma star orbital for a polarized bond, say CO, CF, CBR, any carbon electronegative heteroatom bond has the potential to be involved in an anomeric effect.